What's important is American cities were built around Mexican communities. Barrios came into being from San Antonio, Texas, all the way through here in Los Angeles, California, through Denver, Albuquerque, Arizona, Phoenix, Tucson, uh, San Jose, all the way up to San Francisco, um, San Diego, all the way up to San Francisco. And so what happened is as American cities are going to be built around the American, uh, Mexican communities, a social, psychological, and organizational cohesiveness occurred. Mexican immigrants naturally are going to move into the barrios. Mexican immigrants are going to create their own barrios. An example is Watts and Compton. They were, they were Mexican railroad camps. So when you go into Watts and Compton, the origins of Watts and Compton are when the Mexicans had built the railroads connecting to Los Angeles, they were just dumped, and that became their area uh, to survive. During World War I, when we look, take a look at the great migration of Southern blacks, uh, of the black experience, as the Southern migration occurs, those moving west are going to enter Watson Compton and be living with the Mexican railroad workers. So as railroads, agriculture, as railroad agriculture and mining interests, along with massive state-sponsored irrigation projects, they assured and perpetuated the need for Mexican labor. Many Mexicans found themselves moving to states like Iowa, Nebraska, Illinois, and Michigan, where they created their own enclaves. So this urban barrio context will be dramatized in the 1920s and 1930s as sociologists became concerned with, quote-unquote, the Mexican problem. Let's go to a film clip and appreciate uh, Los Angeles. Nineteen twenties Los Angeles was a boom town. Pulled by plentiful work in agriculture, factories, and construction, Mexican immigrants headed to the city in ever increasing numbers. In 1900, you had about three to five thousand Mexican Mexican American residents. By 1930, you had about 150 thousand. It's a lot of people. In the 1800s, Mexicans had built Los Angeles from a mission into the capital of Spanish California. In the 1920s, they would help build it again. The story of how Mexicans built the city from a rural town to an industrial metropolis is still largely untold. Without the Mexican labor, much of our infrastructure in the city uh, would not exist. Now immigrants in a land that had once been theirs, Mexicans were viewed as second-class citizens. A Mexican presents a new problem. He's not black and he's not white. How do we fit this new race into the American uh, system of stratification? That is resolved by just simply extending the practices of segregation that had been developed for African-Americans to Mexican-Americans. There were segregated schools. There could be segregated public facilities. For example, the day before they drained the pool, they had International Day, where anyone who wasn't white could go and use the pool. Most immigrants gravitated toward downtown and settled around La Plaza de Nuestra Reina de Los Angeles. Founded in 1781, the plaza had once been the center of Mexican life in Southern California. The plaza was a safe place, it was a romantic place, and it was also a memory of their culture. For the immigrant generation that comes, the sense that the land was once held by uh, a Spanish elite, a Mexican elite, is incredibly important in making people feel that there is a history here that belongs to them. Both my parents had a sense of history and remember the place names of Los Angeles. They always told me that, that you know, that is Sepulveda, that street, um, that's Pico. My father even pointed out the three-story Pico house, which at the time was the most elegant, fancy hotel. And my father whispered in my ear and told me, mijo, he was one of us. Pio Pico was one of us. 
the 1920s, fueled by a growing Mexican population, Mexican culture was experiencing a revival. There's a growth of arts. There's the beginnings of the first ever real Mexican-American music culture. It's recording the music of the Mexican Revolution in Los Angeles. It's exporting it down to Mexico. It's a cultural renaissance in a way that one wouldn't see again until the 1960s. We see restaurants, bakeries, pharmacies, live theaters, not to forget the Hollywood movie industry as well. I mean, we can have people like a young Ramon Navarro, who um, starred in the first silent Ben-Hur, was a Mexican immigrant working as a laborer in downtown Los Angeles. In the era of the silent film, Mexicans became icons of popular culture. A working class girl, Lupe Velez, and the aristocratic Dolores del Rio offered two contrasting images for Mexican women coming of age. Dolores del Rio was discovered in an afternoon tea in Mexico City. She was a wealthy, young newlywed. She does not speak English. If you look at her early stills, she looks like a very beautiful but stereotypical Latin American beauty. The hair's done up behind. She's in this reboso, and she's got this sort of submissive look. Within a few years, when she's an established celebrity, she really sheds the, quote, ethnic imagery. She was able to craft the symbol of the woman on the pedestal, a high-born, sort of Castilian beauty. I think her beauty is incredibly important for a lot of young Mexican women. She's the inspiration to bring cosmetics into the household. She creates an alternative identity, a new 1920s woman in a Mexican style. They're bobbing their hair. They're wearing short dresses or they're wearing bloomers ditching their chaperone and going to the dance hall, the movies. They're saying, no, wait a second, we're not part of the past of Los Angeles. We're actually part of the future. We're not simply relics from a different era. Young Mexicans began to build families and moved east, across the Los Angeles River, to Brooklyn Heights, Belvedere, and Boyle Heights a diverse community in the mountains of East L.A. It was there that Natividad Castaneda, a stonemason who had emigrated from Mexico in 1915, settled with his wife, Gregoria, and their two children, Francisco and his younger sister, Emilia, born in Los Angeles in 1926. It was a happy life that I had when I was a little girl. I used to like to go to school, we used to have some time to play before school started, before we went to do our Pledge of Allegiance. We went to the movies here and there. It used to be a nickel to go to the movies. We used to have a Victrola. I remember one of the records that they used to play. It was a song about Soy Virgencita, Entre las Flores Me Encontrarás. We had a nice summer porch. We had an avocado in the back. My mother used to love avocados. Maybe my dad planted the avocado for her. Okay, so let's appreciate something that, you know, students, what we can understand uh, with regards to, again, um, the urban barrios. Urban barrios became important centers of economic, political, and cultural activity. And as American cities are going to be built around the Mexican communities, a social and psychological 
uh, an organizational cohesiveness is going to occur. And so Mexican immigrants are naturally going to move into the barrios and create their own barrios. <clears throat> 